Milton, I'm here to talk about uh, API design, uh, what we've seen at MuleSoft, what we're doing at MuleSoft, um, and just to talk you through some, some best practices. So I work for MuleSoft, um, been working for MuleSoft for seven years now, uh, based down in Argentina. I've recently moved back to the UK, um, where in Argentina I was working on the, on the core, as architect on the core Mule platform. Um, recently moved back to the UK and I'm now working just around the corner from this crazy looking building in London, uh, which apparently fries cars. Um, but we're not here to talk about me, we're here to talk about APIs. Um, I think everyone's here has come to, to, to talk about APIs, to learn about APIs and best practices. And that's what we're going to do today. But just before we start talking about API best practices, just want to talk to you slightly from the MuleSoft perspective, why we're so interested in APIs and why we're doing so much about APIs. I'm not going to give you our full half an hour corporate presentation, but just two slides kind of saying how we see the world. So we talk about the new enterprise um, to our customers and, and, and to, to, to prospects. And the reason we talk about the new enterprise is because previously everybody did their integration. Everyone's business was behind the firewall. All their integration was behind the firewall. That's changing. As people adopt SaaS applications, iPaaS platforms, um, partner more through open APIs and use devices, the typical enterprise is changing. That integration is now no longer on-premise. It's out there in the cloud. And everything has an API in the cloud. So that's why APIs are so important to us. Um, and obviously, there's, there's all the different types of APIs. We identify open web APIs, B2B APIs, internal APIs, and product APIs. Of course, these are all, all key. Um, and in terms of API design, API best practices, it's, it's all the same. Whether you're building an API internally or publicly, it's still really important to follow best practices. It's still really important to engage developers. It's the same, whatever the, the type of API you're building. So now I want to walk through about uh, three or four different API um, design patterns that that we've really found to work and, and, and we're actually working on. The first of these is the contract is critical. Now, it doesn't matter if you're doing SOAP, REST, uh, hypermedia, or you're not doing hypermedia, you need some kind of contract. Now, in the, in the SOAP world, that's a wisdom. In the REST world, um, where you're not doing hypermedia, you generally got some kind of definition format which defines your resources and the methods and the URLs where you can find them. And in the hypermedia world, well, we're still kind of working on that, but it's more about a contract which defines common vocabularies. Um, but a contract is, is critical. And the contract, the contract is critical because that's where people interact with you. Uh, we talked about the, your API being your product. So your contract is, is the first point of contact that people have with your product. So it's almost as important as packaging. It is as important as packaging. Your contract, your API contract, is like your packaging of your product. Um, that's why it's so important. It's also, I mean, it affects your brand. If you have a bad API and your API is your product, that's going to affect your brand. So that's really important as well. So I, I think that gives an important kind of an idea of why the contract is so important. We see the contract is very important. However you define the contract, it's important. And of course, the contract is used for, for testing. So why do you want a contract? There's, there's really two reasons I, I hear people about talking about contracts um, or description languages, whatever term you use. One is in order to describe an API. So you've built an API or you're going to build an API and you want to describe that API. And the other reason for a contract is to design an API. So um, this really comes back to the, I mean, if you, if you think about it in, in web service terms, do you do WSDL first or you don't do WSDL first? That's kind of the way people always used to talk about it. Uh, and it really depends what your goals are. If you're really interested in creating a good contract, um, you shouldn't really be trying to generate a contract based on something you've already built. You really need to be designing an API up front, and then you should be binding that to the implementation. So the contract is key, but it's very important to define the contract as what um, your user is going to interact with, not as a second thought generated based on something. And that kind of takes me on to the next um, yeah, so it, it's really, you need to ask yourself the question, are you using a contract to document your API? 
or are you actually going to model your API using a contract? Um, and for me, you need a contract. You're going to use a contract or a modeling language, but you should be modeling your API and then binding your implementation to that model, not the other way around. So I personally think it's a really bad practice to build an implementation in Java, annotate it with annotations, and then from that generate a description language. That might be great and easy for the developer, but it's not giving the best user experience for that API, or it almost certainly isn't. Next thing is design to delight. So if your API is your product, and your API is the way in which developers consume your product, you really need to delight them. You need to make it a great experience for them. Um, how could you do that? Well, you can design for them. That's what we just talked about in terms of um, creating a good contract. Um, you can iterate quickly, so obtain that feedback from them. And obviously, that's a lot to do with how you engage with developers. The more you engage with developers, the more feedback you can obtain from them, the more you can iterate, and the better experience you can give to your API consumers, um, and, and that way you, you, you generate adoption. The third pattern, again, this is slightly repetitive, uh, but it's a kind of a different way of, of thinking about it, is think APX, not API. So in the same way, um, a number of years back, we, people stopped talking about UI and started talking about UX. It's not about what you show on the screen. It's about how the user interacts and uses the user interface. Well, we need to think in the same way about APIs. It's not just the methods and the resources that are exposed in an API. It's the whole API user experience. How do they obtain um, the information, the documentation, through to how do they play around with the API and prototype with the API? How do they then build a client? That whole API experience is, is very, very important if we want developers to be successful and we want our API to be adopted. And that's really the way that we're going to sell. If our API is a product, the, the way to sell it, we're not going to sell it to people on the high street. We're going to sell it to developers that are building apps that then everyone uses. The fourth one is use patterns. Now, if I have one big complaint about REST, it's that there are no patterns. Everyone does it differently. I mean, in a way, that's good. But in a way, that's an issue, because you need to build a, 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 a consumer for an API. And you need to interact with, um, I don't know, for example, you're building a consumer, and you want to page the results. Okay, You only want, want to get 10 pages at a time. Everybody does that differently. Um, you want to um, have the concept of a collection. That's done differently. You want to obtain a JSON instead of an XML. Well, some people pass an accept header. Some people pass an extension. Everything's different. Um, now, that's good. Variety is good, but it's also a problem. So what's the middle ground? Well, the middle ground is that there are no specific standards telling you how to do it. I mean, REST isn't a standard. It's an architectural style. Um, but there's still value in having patterns so that maybe you internally within an organization can define, we're going to do collections this way, we're going to do paging this way, we're going to do security this way, and then everybody in the development team does it the same way uh, rather than having multiple different ways of doing it. So patterns firstly need to be defined, then of course you need to share them, and then uh, they need to be discoverable, and then people can reuse them. And by doing that, not only can you share knowledge and share patterns, but you can also um, create more consistent APIs. What type of patterns are we talking about? Well, resources, if you think about it, there's different types of resources. There's collections, there's members of collections, there's documents. I mean, it, it depends on your particular API, but there are different types of, of resources. Um, and there's a good book by a guy called, um, I can't, don't know how to pronounce his surname, but Mark Massey. Um, REST API Design Cookbook, and he talks through a number of patterns there. That's, that's a really good read. The other thing is not just resource types, but traits. Um, you may have a method, a get method on a resource that needs to be secured, or you may have a get method on a collection that needs to be paged. Um, those aren't really quite so much resource types. They're more about traits. They're more about specific behaviors that need to apply to an API method. So the fifth really um, key is to engage developers. And again, this is we've, we've talked about some of this. But um, in order to have a great API, not only have you got to build what you think your developers want, but you actually got to engage them uh, and obtain that feedback. There's multiple ways of engaging them, of course. Social tools are great. Um, having portals where APIs are discoverable. There's programmable web. Uh, every 
API vendor has got some kind of um, tool set where you can look up APIs. Um, there's the whole social aspect of being able to rate APIs, discuss the, um, provide feedback and discuss them. Interactive consoles uh, are popping up everywhere. These are very, very valuable for developers to be able to play with the API before they build a real client for it and use it in production. Uh, IO Docs um, has an interactive console. Swagger has an interactive console. Raml has an interactive console. And there's others as well. Uh, but they're a really important tool. And then there are some, some newer tools cropping up as well, um, such as uh, Webshell and the Raml Notebook, which actually allow you to not just play with these APIs via interactive console, but actually script up interactions with them and actually combine multiple APIs um, in, a, in a scripted fashion and prototype with them quickly and, and share what you've prototyped. So those are really the key kind of API, uh, keys to API design that we see and that relates in a lot of ways to, to what we've been doing at MuleSoft with Raml. So I guess what, probably one of the first questions that people ask me when we talk about Raml is, is why Raml? Why did we sit down and, and start thinking and, and defining a description language when there are so many out there? I mean, there's Wado, there's Swagger, there's IO Docs, there's Google Discovery Docs, there's Appery Blueprint, uh, there's REST Doc as well, which isn't here. But there's lots of these different uh, description language already there. And one of the reasons that we, we I mean, when we, when we look through these, all of these obviously manifest structure. They manifest structure in the sense of the different resources and the child resources and the methods available on these resources. Um, some of them are more human readable than others. Apri Blueprint does a great job at defining uh, a, re a really great readable form for your API. Um, but not really many of them capture patterns in any way. Uh, we felt that having a, a very readable definition language was very important. Structure is, of course, important. But also being able to capture patterns was extremely important as well. And th there was no, there's, there's no real um, REST definition language as such um, that exists to do that. So do we really want to start from scratch? Well, we haven't started from scratch. We're, we're built on top of YAML, uh, which is a very good user-readable markup language. Um, that's a superset of JSON. It's optimized for human readability, and it's really good for this kind of thing. It's, it's both human readable and machine readable. And there's already some tools out there which we've been able to leverage. So RAML stands for RESTful API Modeling Language. And the reason it's a modeling language rather than a description format goes back to, to the, the, the previous best practice that I talked about, where your contract is, is really should be something you model, something you model um, to provide the best API experience for your developers, not something that's generated that describes an API. So we've um, actually formed a, a work group. Uh, there's a number of other kind of companies that are involved in this and are, are inputting, and they're actually using this already in, in beta form with, with some of their, their products and projects. Um, this is roughly what it looks like. So this is just a very, very basic definition of a collection of users that has a get method with a single query parameter called name, and then a post method which takes a user ID on the um, URL path, URI path, and then has get, put, and delete methods. This isn't fully filled out. Um, you can fill this out with query parameters, headers, descriptions, et cetera. But what's really good about this compared to, to some of the other description languages is it has a, a built-in um, support for both resource types and traits. So here you'll see users is of type collection. And that collection, the items in that collection, uh, have a schema user. Then the specific users have a type member. So that implies that they have a, a get um, and a delete. So those don't actually need to be defined. And both of these are secured. And these are defined elsewhere. I'll, ta I'll take you through a, a real example of this in a second. At the same time, we don't force you, the, the idea isn't to force you down a path of patterns only. Uh, one of the first incarnations of this 
we, we really thought that it was a good idea to force you down and to use these different patterns. The problem with that is that you then can't use it to document existing APIs. You can only use it for greenfield development. Um, whereas this reusable pattern approach is great because it allows you to do document existing APIs. It allows you to define um, patterns around maybe things that you've already done. And it's great for greenfield development where you want to maybe define some of these patterns before you, before you get started. But it covers the um, query parameters, headers. You can define multiple responses, so 200 response, 401 response, um, and then all the details around that. So up there we have the, the base URI. Um, you can also include uh, URI templates in any of the URIs here. Down here we're defining a query parameter and headers. Uh, these will apply to this get request on the user. Multiple responses with um, status codes. And then in terms of the, the bodies, um, currently there's support for um, form data, JSON and XML. And there's two different ways in which you can define what that looks like. You can only define it by schema, and that schema can be externalized, or you can define it by example. Or you can actually do both. I personally like to do both. The schema, because it's, um, if, it, it, it forces, I mean, it, it helps define the contract. But the example is great as well, because then when you use the console um, to play around with these, you can just copy paste the example request into the console and hit try it, and you don't have to, 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 to mess around creating your own re uh, request message. So these resource types actually support uh, polyform um, inheritance as well. So here we have a, a base type uh, and a collection type. Uh, these resource definitions can be included within a RAML definition file, or they can be externalized and shared. I mean, that's one of the, the important things about patterns is that they can be published, discoverable, and shared. That supports this because these can be imported. So here you'll see the collection resource type is defined here, but the base resource type is actually defined externally. And there's an example of, so here you can actually, within a resource type, you can mix in a trait as well, so that it's completely mix and matchable. These are examples of traits. So here are two traits, paged and searchable. They're defined here. So page trait um, has two query parameters, start and pages, obviously with, with descriptions. And searchable has a, just a single query parameter, Q, which allows you to search. Now, these can, once these are defined, these can obviously be shared and imported. But once this is done, you can actually apply these to any other resource just by simply doing is paged and is searchable. That's, I mean, we find that very, very powerful because it means that this description becomes much, much more compact. We're not redefining again and again um, Q as a query parameter or number of pages as a query parameter on all of these resources that, are, that need to be pageable or searchable. So I talked about schemas, um, the fact they can be externalizable or they can be embedded. Um, you can have a JSON schema or an XML schema. Those can both be embedded within the definition file, or they can be externalized. Or you can include examples, which I personally like to do, as I mentioned. And then the, the, there's also the option of using form parameters. If you want to use form parameters rather than um, a, a body um, that's being sent, that's also fully supported. Another interesting thing, and, and this is very important when consuming APIs, is security. Um, so there's some built-in security schemas here for basic authentication and OAuth. Um, and then these are also applied. It's slightly different. They're, they're similar to traits, but they're, they're kind of in their own category. You can apply these um, security traits to specific resources, um, and then that will um, pass through the, the correct authorization headers and define the, the response codes. This is also used by the, the console that's generated so that it will allow you to authenticate um, with OAuth um, to actually to, to interact with the API. Okay, so just want to have a quick look at the, the tools um, just so you can have an, a, an idea other than just in, in PowerPoint. So 
This is the API designer. Um, this is a tool whereby you can um, define these uh, RAML APIs within um, a, a web-based interface. Um, this is based on YAML. It's probably, that's probably a bit small. This is based on YAML. Um, so here I can define the, the APIs. Now I've got both speakers. Does that work now? Yeah, that's great. So here I can define it in real time. I can uh, specify a, a resource called talks, and I can give it a get method and a, a post method. The get method, I can give a, a description. This gets a talk. The get, I can give a, a body, which is returned, sorry. Um, a response. So maybe I have a, a 200 response, which has a, a body, um, which, and here I can define the, the schema, or I can define a, an example. In this case, maybe I can define um, actually, sorry, I need to define the type first. So in this case, let's do XML. Here I could define the schema. I can define an example. So let's define an example. Um, let's just say OK. And I can very, very quickly build out an API like this. Um, and on the, the right here, the console is actually generated in, in real time as I'm building this out with the description. Um, we still haven't built out the, the mocking service for this, but shortly this will also have a mocking service. So as you're building out your API, here on the left, you can actually um, play with it and, and as you would with the console when, once it's deployed. So this tool is really easy to use because not only is there autocomplete, uh, but also you have uh, all these pointers down below. Let me just pull up one that was done earlier. So, I mean, this is a real example, which uh, is a much more complete API, which returns products and uh, products and presentations. So here we have a set of um, four or five schemas, which are then referenced down below. So I need to, to zoom in a bit here. So we have some, some schemas that have been defined here and then can be reused. Uh, this particular one's externalized. This one's embedded. Here we have the definition of resource types. So we have a base resource type, which just defines the, the 200 response. Uh, this is a typical collection resource uh, that has a get and a post. Um, and uh, this is interesting here, where you can actually parameterize the schemas that are used here. So I can implement this resource type on one of my resources and specify the schema there. And here are some traits that have been defined for, um, where are the traits gone? Sorry, I collapsed them. Here are some traits that have been described for paged and secured. So when you actually look at these resources themselves, presentations, presentations is a collection, a, pro, uh, a collection of what? A collection of presentations, that's the schema reference. It's secured, and it has a single query parameter called title. There's nothing else there because everything else has been predefined in the patterns that I'm reusing. There's also the, the product resource. The product resource is, um, again, I can't, I'm zoomed in, can't scroll down, but the product resource is also, it's a collection. The schema this time is product. It's also secured. So you can really see the power here of actually being able to not just build APIs thinking about the user experience, um, but actually visualize them and eventually be able to actually try them out as well. The idea here is that you're not thinking about the implementation to build an API. You're not building a, a JAX WS, sorry, JAX RS um, class and annotating it and then generating something and just handing that off to the, the API consumer. Here you're actually building an API, using patterns, and thinking about the consumer. Uh, because here on the right, you, you can see what the, what, the, what the developer that's going to consume your API is going to see in the development tools. So this is one of the, the key tools around RAML. Um, the other thing, of course, is that um, is the idea of a, 
an ecosystem whereby you can go and find APIs and play with APIs. Now, this is an example of, of one that we have on API Hub. This is by no means MuleSoft exclusive or anything. I mean, everybody is doing this with the API console, Swagger, IODocs. Um, but this is an important way in which you can engage your developers, allowing them to play with the API. And then one of the other tools is, uh, which is in a lot of ways very similar to, to Webshell, um, is this API notebook, which allows you to prototype with APIs. So I'm going to, just to save time, I'm going to copy paste here, but um, if I have a, an API that's defined with RAML, I can quickly create a, is that viewable? An API client for that. This obviously uses JavaScript behind the scenes. Okay, so I'm doing something wrong here. I'm not sure what. Okay, so we'll skip that. There's some formatting issue with what I'm copying and pasting, I think. But anyway, the idea is you can create a, a real-time client in JavaScript and then interact with it. Um, there's support for authenticating with OAuth. And then you can even do some very basic mashups with this, whereby you can... Um, create a client for, say, Twitter, and then create another client for, for GitHub, and do some simple mashups here. The other thing that's cool about this, just very briefly, is that these are automatically saved um, over in, um, as GitHub gists. So if I copy this ID here, and go and, and look up the, the gist. So these are automatically saved as, as gists, so that's very easy to share these with, with others. It's not in some kind of proprietary format or anything at all. So what's next? There's, there's a lot of effort that we're putting into to this, um, growing the, the library of APIs that have RAML specification so that this can be used. Uh, there's talk about doing some, some uh, converters so that we can use Waddle or Swagger definitions as well here. One of the interesting things that's um, been done recently is the, the guys from SOAP UI have generated a plugin, so now you can import a RAML definition into SOAP UI and generate all the, all the client stubs to actually interact with um, an API or test the API, so that's really interesting. And one of the things we're starting working on um, now is support for JAXRS, so that those that don't want to use like a platform such as Mule to do this can generate some, some JAXRS uh, implementations from this. And of course, the other thing that we're looking to do is to evolve the, the RAML spec and if there's anyone that has thoughts or is interested in, in this space, uh, the spec is up there on, on GitHub. Um, it's a case of, of reading through it and getting involved. There's a forum up there as well to, to collaborate on this. So, I mean, jump into the forum and there's a lot of discussion going on about um, where the spec's going, what's missing, what's not missing. Okay, so if this is interesting and you'd like to, to get involved or like to speak to me about it or see what we can do, then then catch me, I'm going to be around. Um, and thanks. We have time for one question. I have a question. You have a question? So, so yes, just about the notebook, you know. Okay. Uh, just about the notebook. Uh, uh, I've made my talk about containerization of APIs, you know, and transform using objects to de to describe and help developers to integrate APIs. So why a company like MuleSoft, um, by making API Hub, and thinks this is one of the right way to do it? So because you have the RAML spec. Okay. So w what is, why making it? It's to, to, uh, to target uh, JavaScript uh, client-side developers, or so? Why API Notebook? Yeah, why API Notebook? So the, the, the main goal behind that is, is not to actually then run integrations or mashups using that platform. That's, that was never really the goal. Maybe it will evolve into something, who knows. Uh, the goal really was just to give um, a slightly more interactive space to, to play around with APIs. So the interactive consoles that are generated, they're great, uh, but they're very, very resource method level. You go in, you, cho sorry, you choose your resource, you choose your 
uh, get, you paste in a request, and you're done. And it's, it's very, very, um, I don't know, it's not real, if you like. I mean, it's good for testing and playing around. The idea between doing this at a, at a kind of JavaScript object level is it becomes more real. You can start thinking, well, I could do this. I could pull my photos from Flickr and, and post them to Facebook. And you can actually start prototyping and playing around. That was the goal, just a playground. I guess that's the, where it started, as yeah. a playground. Cool playground. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dan. You.